Welcome. I am going to do something unusual. I'm going to start off with all the key messages. And then I'm going to prove to you over the next three hours that they're right. And then I'm going to finalize with the key messages again, all right? So the key message is it's been a busy last couple of years, more or less. I think we would admit we've stubbed our toe in a couple of places, but I think essentially failing forward. So we've moved in the right direction, and where we've had a problem, we've corrected ourselves. During that period, the organization has grown quite significantly, and I think we've added new capability, but also we've preserved a lot of the history of the business from the past, and so that culture from both businesses is going to fit us into the future as well. I got bad news for you, and we'll talk about it in a second. I think the market's going to get harder, believe it or not. But we do have a very clear strategy, and we are well positioned with the USP. And if we execute, actually the business, I believe, can be the most exciting premium wine and spirits business in the world. And I'm not kidding. I'm from the States. There's a lot of premium stuff sold there. But not with the breadth, not with the kind of interesting thing. Yanks drink a lot of white Zinfandel. You know that. So we can be part of the most exciting business that other people in other countries want to come into the UK, into London, and work for us. But it means we're going to have to execute an FY16. I'm going to move this chair before I fall over, and you guys all laugh at me. Hermie, I know you would laugh at me. So you see that. It's a little blurry. It's not the vodka. It's not the whiskey that you had downstairs. 2015 was a bit of a blur. We did a lot, and in some instances, we stubbed our toe, particularly me. And coming on the back end of some focus groups that happened very recently, I wanted to share with you some of my thoughts on what we, and as a leadership team, need to do moving forward. I think we need to improve our alignment. So ensure there's one team working towards one goal. How are we going to do that? We're going to make sure that everybody has clear goals and objectives and your boss reviews them with you on a regular basis. We tried doing that last year, but didn't quite get there. There's going to be monthly performance reports, and everybody will know how we're doing as a business and how you're doing as an individual. And we will have a clear people agenda, reward and recognition, and we're going to talk about values. We're all going to be working with the same values. We need to improve our communication. How are we going to do that? There will be monthly cascades of information that will come out to the organization, some in person, some through the internet. We're going to relaunch the SMT, which was a strategic management team. It took key individuals in the company, and we worked together to talk about business strategy and the kinds of things that we needed to do to make ourselves more effective, and that's the focal point for communication back to the rest of the organization. Pace, speed, and service. One of the things that we lose sometimes with all the system implementations was sort of this speed and this focus on service because we got a bit frustrated. That's not uncommon when you put in systems that you have to go through the corrective actions and continue to tweak it to be more effective. We had a bit of a challenge this year. What we're going to end up doing is doing everything we can to automate our transactions, limit our bureaucracy. We had a lot to do last year, and part of that was we weren't exactly sure what the big thing was that was going to deliver what we needed to do, quite frankly, to make our owners happy. We put a whole bunch of uh, lines in the, in the pond, and uh, thank goodness co-bought our bit. So we've got a very focused view in 2016, which we'll, we'll talk about in a second. And then an empowered organization. We had this great group that we spent a lot of time and money training the super user group on the BPR and as soon as we went live we disbanded the whole thing and this whole group that knew how to fix the systems and processes we didn't get them together and empower them to do that this group will continue to do that in the future we're also allocating resources towards our customers our regions are essentially business units and so when they have meetings the sales guys we need marketing people there supply chain people analytical folks HR people so that we can support the people that are closest to the customer. These are the things that we're going to do, learning from 2015. I'm going to briefly talk about our financial performance. So basically, outside of retail, way to go Pepper and Great Western Wine Company, we fell a little bit short in just about every area. 
Now, I would suggest uh, a couple of things. In the off trade, Prosecco didn't help us. That was a major contributor. The international business, if I could explain, uh, we are getting divorced from our partners, said Asoli. Divorces are never easy. And so we've been dividing the children up and the assets. And what we're doing is actually migrating the business off. And so the difference between other and international is sort of a wash. The international business will essentially migrate uh, from the Cetisoli standpoint entirely to them in January. We will continue to get two years of income and payout from them, but in the meantime, the international business was a little bit noisy. So when you look down at the bottom line, you see that we fell 10% short of our plan, and this is just a notria. This does not include co. Now, the one thing I would suggest is as we began through the year and we're looking at an acquisition, we did feel like there was a strong likelihood it was going to take place, and so we continued to forward invest in the system integration and processes instead of changing any of the actions that we took so that we could be in position for FY16. But if you really look at the business, this facility costs a million pounds more than our old facility. It's worth more than a million, but a million pounds more, half that just the coffee machine. <laughs> so if you were to look at the EBITDA normalized, we're actually about 20% above where we were last year as just a natria. So during the middle of the year, we had a conversation with Blue Gem. We thought the co-integration was going to happen. We knew this was going to be a messy year. So let's get a lot of stuff done this year because it's all mucked up. But FY16 has to really be... Uh, a, a real solid performing year. So FY15 uh, a little bit behind, but for very good reasons. And I think if you were to look at what we've done over the past year and a half, basically, just last year we came up with a strategy, and as part of the strategy we knew we needed a stronger foundation, some people, some capability. So there has been a whole host of new capability that has been brought in, and I think have worked very well with the existing folks that have been here for a substantial period of time. Now, when I started, that's where I was. The co-folks are lucky enough not to have been there. I think that was a picture from the day I started, and those are the cars that were there. But we <laughs> spent about a million pounds to move into that, and that was no small task. And we've had to build and increase our capability to get into position to add some additional business on top of that. We also upgraded NAV. It was a Herculean effort, uh, a couple of stubbed toes, but we are in a very good position moving forward in what we can do in comparison to our competitors. And then our little partners at Co joined us in August. Let's talk about the future, 2016. You'll see that's clear, 2015 blurry. Did you get that? <laughs> oh, you guys. So this is not a very clear chart. But what this is, uh, shows is our strategic planning process. And I've showed it to you before, and I'd like to talk a little bit about it. So up here, as a strategic plan, you want to know what's going on out there in the market and how we fit into it. And then depending on how that looks, you want to embark upon certain strategies so that you can deliver the best performance. And so when you look at the outside world and how you're positioned, then you go ahead and develop these things that are really important. We call them must-win battles. And then people have strategic initiatives, an initiative to go do something to be able to uh, impact that. And there's a business case around it. So I'm going to walk us through this. I'm going to first talk about the marketplace. What is the current market conditions there in the UK? In the world of wine and dining, which we're strong, it's positive. There are people that are dining. <coughs> It's growing and it's premiumizing. We are extremely well positioned in the on trade in that regard. I would say, however, there is a substantial glut of grapes out there, which is gonna be made into wine, which inevitably comes into the UK. So it is gonna get a little tougher when it comes to pricing because this stuff's gonna come in below cost. Another positive trend is the cocktail culture. And if the U.S. is any example, there's a long way to go here in the U.K. because all these millennials, some of you in there, go to the cocktail. I'm too old for any of that. But it is a very positive trend, and Co. is perfectly positioned to be able to go after that. 
So these are two areas within the UK market that is actually very positive for us. Now, the problem is anybody that had to invest money over the last uh, you know, few weeks, you've probably had some problems. I know Eric Bernal, you probably got a lot of money tucked away at the Chinese stock market, don't you? I went some Hong Kong wine futures or something, Eric. You've had some problems there. A lot of people are saying that this is a forewarning of some economic downturn. You guys know, last time there was an economic downturn, it was very difficult in the on-trade and off-trade. So if this is the case, it's something that we have to worry a little bit about. But in the meantime, we're not going to change course. We're going to continue to do what we're going to do because I think we're well positioned. And if there's anything that's more volatile than the Chinese stock market, it's what's going on in the UK on trade from a consolidation of the distributors. And I want to talk a little bit mainly to the Inatria folks because our competitors historically have been who? Boutno, Liberty Wine, Cobb de Perrin, maybe Babendum in a couple of accounts, never foul, you know, Matthew Clark would never be an issue, right? Because we're premium. Mm -hmm. Now you're going to hear all sorts of different folks out there from um, LWC, from Venus. So this is a whole different marketplace that we are playing in now that we're composite. And there is a significant dynamic going on here, and we're going to talk about how this impacts us in a second. I just wanted to give you a couple of trend rates, though. This is the off trade. Down 1%, everything's priced down. Everything's essentially a disaster, except you're selling a lot of Prosecco, but you're discounting the price to sell. Does that make sense? No. John? So we got a bit of a train wreck, and I don't see that getting fixed anytime soon. We've done some interesting things in the off trade. We've embarked upon some very um, innovative kinds of ideas and thoughts. We haven't delivered them to the extent that we've wanted to, largely because most of the resources of the company have migrated over into the on-trade with the co-acquisition, which makes all the sense in the world. This is still an extremely important channel for us, and the guys are going to bootstrap it up and continue to drive over the course of the next year, but it's not going to get any easier in this marketplace. In the on-trade, the volume essentially is up or flat. But price is up everywhere, and even in the in interesting sparkling, the Prosecco, not only is it up 30%, but the price is up 17%. So what you see in the on-trade, people are trading up. They're moving, and they've aspired, not just in wine, but also in spirits, to get into a higher level. And if you look at every country of origin, <laughs> you're seeing price appreciation in the on-trade. So that bodes very well for our market right now. And in the spirit side, what's interesting is even in the areas where you see a decline, it's all standard spirits, you see growth in all the premium and substantial growth in the on-trade. So standards down, the premium spirits are up. And so if you just look at gin as an example, okay, Gordon's is essentially flat, the biggest product out there. Everything else is up, including up to triple digits at extremely expensive levels. So we are really well positioned. When I say we, I'm at Co. Co's really well positioned to help us go and get this piece of the market out there. But I want to talk a little bit about the dynamic and what's happened. So a couple of years ago recently, Waverly tipped over. It was sort of Waverly and Matthew Clark. When they tipped over, Matthew Clark sucked up all the incremental business. And whatever they didn't suck up ended up going to some regional folks. B I, uh, uh, Babendum bought PLB, which is largely off-trade, so they've migrated away from the premium and a little bit more into the national accounts, except they've lost a little bit of business because Matthew Clark has done everything that they can to steal it. So Conviviality acquired Matthew Clark, and they paid way too much money, 200 million pounds for it. The next closest bid was 150. So when you pay that much money, how do you get that kind of delivery? Ten times multiple, basically. So they are literally going out and doing absolutely everything possible to buy any bit of business out there and ask Daniel Harris, and he because uh, they're trying to suck every bit of profit we have down at the Pretzos or the Youngs. So any national account they don't have, they're going after. Now, we don't have a bunch of them. The ones that we do have, Dan has done a great job locking up, but they're aggressively going after Babendum as well. So Babendum is in a very difficult position, and if you believe the market, Conviviality is out there uh, basically making bids for every business out there and trying to roll it up. So it's a very interesting dynamic. Amethyst went and bought Bob Lake, so they're a bit, a bit of a mini-us. 
but we can't let them, because of premium, now they're a bit composite and they're moving up north, we can't let them get oxygen because they could uh, impact <laughs> us. And then Carlsberg, they have a significant footprint across the UK, not just selling beer, but they deliver lots of wine and spirits. So anywhere where our uh, Anatria businesses are going in that has a Carlsberg distributor, they're probably selling the wine and spirits as well. Now, Carlsberg's had a significant issue, fired their CEO, they're looking at their options, and they're going to sell their distribution business, probably to Kuna Nagel. If that happens, anybody that has a Carlsberg business or, or Carlsberg spirits, you should go after it because that's probably going to go away pretty quickly. So that's a dramatic impact. C and C up here, they just announced that they're struggling, and so there's a couple hundred people that they're firing. Could someone open a couple of windows? It's going to get hot. People are going to fall asleep, and one one would be me. And then on the wine side, you've got Treasury Wine Estates that just bought Diageo, and Accolade is going to go public here pretty soon. And Barry Brothers is sitting down here, and Dan Jago just moved from Tesco in there, and he basically said the on trade's probably the place I want to go after to find business, because they just reported losing 11 million pounds. This is an incredibly dynamic um, marketplace right now. Lots of deck chairs moving around. But luckily for us, <coughs> Businesses between Co and Anatri have come together. We've spent a lot of time, and there's been a lot of investment this week, hopefully getting this alignment and focus on what we're going to do so we're not going to be disrupted. But I will tell you, over the next year, every one of these guys are going to be desperate to pick up any bit of business. And if we go pick a piece of business up from one of these folks, expect they're going to come back at us pretty hard because there's a lot of people pretty nervous about the combination of Co and Anatria. Okay? So to just further reinforce, Dan uh, has done a great job of picking up some national accounts, but ultimately our strength as a business is down here where our customer requirements are substantial, where the customer needs intense account management, bottle picking, daily shipments, all of these kinds of complexities we can handle. Matthew Clark can't. They're putting big arctics out there with pallets. That's why they have a low cost. So there is a competitive position that we have out here in the <coughs> regional accounts that gives us a substantial advantage over the big boys that are shipping around 10-ton lorries. So just as an example, if you were to have information on Matthew Clark's profitability, <laughs> you might want to compare our regional wine business between Cohen and Natria to Matthew Clark. We're earning 22 pounds of margin. They're earning 12. So we're about twice as profitable. Why? Because they are used to big, gigantic pallets of wine. They cannot have 3,000 SKUs. Now, they're trying to get around it. They're partnering with other folks and sending orders to masters of malt to ship to their customers. But they can't do this regional business. We can. Conversely, we find it difficult to do the national business where their profit is twice per case ours on the wine side. And why is that? It takes us six to seven pounds per case warehouse and outbound. It takes them a pound 50. So they've got about a five pound advantage on just the outbound shipping versus us. So now that we think about it from a strategic planning standpoint, do you guys want to arm Russell Matthew Clark over price? Probably not the right strategic thing to do. So what we want to do is continue to develop and drive and leverage this area where we have a bit of a unique position. It is regionals, but it's this premium channel activation because we know this can actually even help the big guys do well. So we should be able to go to Mitchells and Butler and be able to help them activate their wine and spirits category as a competitive advantage to everyone else. LWC, Venus, Matthew Clark, they're going to buy price, price, price. If we get into an arm wrestle over just price, we're going to lose. We need service. We need the value add. That's the kind of accounts we're going to go after, and we're going to be better than anybody else to do that. So we understand the market. You guys get a sense of the market. 
clear on that? So, so how do we fit into it in this regional? What does this look like? Well, one of the things that we did when we lo were looking at the two businesses, we brought A.T. Carney in, some folks from Co, some folks from Anatri, and said, let's get in and literally look account by account and understand where we are and how um, this could work together. And when you looked at it, we've got of scale outlets, about 4,000 outlets out there. And of these 4,000 outlets, we only have about 400 that are overlapped. Well, that's a pretty big opportunity. Because if we, as a Natria, want to go in and get a fine wine customer, it takes months. You have to go in, you have to convince them how great you are, you have to spend a couple of times, you have to take some samples, you have to take them to a vineyard, at least that's what Les does. So 12 months later, you might get an order. Well, we're already in these accounts. They hopefully like us. We're already shipping to them. They already have credit. Well, let's just throw some spirits on the back end of it, right? That's a big opportunity. And in fact, it's a huge opportunity. So if you look at the existing business that we have, now we're falling a little bit short of the 4.5, but our base business as a notcher is 4.5. Co's about 3.2. And actually bringing the business over here, you can't really see it there, but that's about another three. So that puts us at about 11 million pounds. And I would say that the opportunity of these conversions are so huge, it's not even huge. It's Donald Trump, huge. <laughs> so if you were to convert every customer that we currently have as a Natria and put spirits in at the same pace as Co has sold them, there's 5.4 million pounds of opportunity. And if Co, where they're not selling wine, met the same kind of objectives that a Natria has in their existing wine accounts, there's three too. That's eight. Nine million pounds, not even getting a new customer, taking existing customers and converting them. And I'll tell you right now, go ask Babendum or anybody else where they could find nine million pounds of opportunity sitting around. It doesn't happen. This is huge. So um, there's a new business, you can't see it, I'll show you in a second. And then the premium bars. All these style bars, these cocktail bars, this is where Co has been tremendous at getting share, getting the mixologist, having this broad, complex portfolio. And they've been limited to London and within the East. So if we can now take that kind of co-magic and bring it up to Liverpool, to Leeds, to Manchester, and all these other crazy towns I've never heard of, that <laughs> is another big opportunity. And it gives us a big halo impact, right? So let me say one more time, the opportunity you, all right? <laughs> so to get underneath this huge opportunity, we have spent a lot of time, weeks and weeks, meetings and meetings, I heard all about the weeding and weeding and weeks, to get through and identify account by account what everybody believes they can do to convert. This is a substantial, and there's been a lot of work, and I really appreciate everything that's been done, but basically 1,700 accounts, outlets, that we believe is a natria, we can convert into spirits, about 155 opportunities on the co-side to get into more wine. Now the challenge is, we're gonna need some co-help to get some of this stuff, but this is a great opportunity for both businesses. It is larger than we could ever imagine. Not only that, but if you look at share, so this bar is share, not the singer, market share, and then this line is essentially the outlets, the external outlets that we have an opportunity to go after. Now, I will point out right now to John Grace, that's wrong. So the CGA data in London is wrong. But we have about a 20 share in London. Everywhere else, we're under 10, six, seven. And look at these outlets out there, particularly in Central. Boy, that's a nice opportunity for us to combine <coughs> to go after. So that wasn't even included in the eight million pounds of opportunity, but the way that we've structured the sales force identifies people whose specific role is to go after new business because we want to grow beyond that seven share. So that's how we fit into the market. So we talked about the opportunity, we talked about where we fit. So now let's talk about, oh, Gemma hates this. Hates this. You hate my house. Hate my house. 
But look, we want to get 17 million EBITDA by 2017. In order to do that, we have to go do a couple of key things, and I want to highlight those. Those are what we're talking, must win battles. I know you can't see this. I'm going to focus on the key things here in a second. And then under that, each group has specific initiatives that they have to drive. So let's talk about those must win battles. Account conversions. This is converting our accounts from wine into a composite opportunity. We have to integrate the business. So in order to actually get that conversion, we need to have inventory here. We need to actually sell it. We need to talk, uh, have the customer service. We need to uh, bill them correctly. We need to collect money. That's always a good thing. So that has to be done, and that's no small task. We've got Zoe on it, which usually she's a superwoman. She'll handle it. But um, this is all hands on deck. need to sort that out. Commercial execution. Inevitably, when we start driving these account conversions, people are going to throw curveballs at us. Our competitors are going to say, oh, yeah, well, maybe a Natri and Co. can do that, but I'm going to give you cakes. I'm going to give you a beer. I'm going to give you this price reduction. I'm going to... So we need to make sure that it's not the sales guys in the trenches, the marketing people, the buyers, the supply chain folks are all working together to understand what we need to do to deliver that, and that means changing the way that we execute. <coughs> we just went live this week on a system called AGR, and that system is helping us to do something called sales and operations planning. And we've been migrating there, and Tim Hobbs, the king of SNOP, where are you, Tim? There you go, brother. Stand up, brother. Come on, there's Tim, King SNOP. So if you ever really want to fall asleep, you sit down the next day to dinner tonight and say, tell me all about MAPES. <laughs> tell me all about supply chain variances and demand planning. But ultimately, we basically were guessing on how much inventory we needed. And now we've got a tool that allows us to not only forecast it accurately, but also to keep our inventory levels down, our costs down. So we know within our business, we've got about a million pounds of surplus wine. Co has about a million pounds of surplus wine. And if we actually were operating effectively, you could take another million pounds out of our inventory and not impact service level at all. There's three million pounds of cash that we can deliver, but it means we need to change slightly on how we operate. And this supply chain network design, there's some things that Martin needs to do to help us continue to beat our competition. It means another warehouse up north. If we're going to go get that share, we probably need another warehouse to provide the same kind of service level in London that we do up north. Carl, you want to go up there? You can run it. Liverpool, brother. Stoke, you're the man. So there's some other tools that we need to develop under the supply chain that help us be much better than our competitor. So here are the key things that you will see as goals and objectives that you will learn about that will be very uh, much in your goals and objectives and will be aligned uh, as a company moving forward. So again, in the supply chain, Northern Warehouse, there's a warehouse management system, uh, scanning technology, GPS tracking, uh, how do we get national capability? When we get to a size and scale, we can't have Daniel Harris go in there with a five pound a case cost disadvantage. There's ways that we can go about getting national capability. We'll probably look at that Q2, Q3. Um, electronic proof of delivery and then the SNOP process. So again, the supply chain has, even on top of that, some other big initiatives. Portfolio strategy. So again, the kinds of things that we want to do, let people know that we are still the best, most premium wine business out there, but also we have significant spirits capability at a premium level. Why not pick up our own mangrove and have our own spirits agency? That's something that basically every spirits distributor is doing. There's no reason we can't do that as well. So then how do we make sure that we can engage with the right uh, spirits people and keep everything at a premium level? <clears throat> and then there's a couple other system enhancements. So all of these are the initiatives that support those must-win battles. If you could see my house, it would make complete sense. <laughs> you guys got that? Okay. So there's a plan all the way through the business. <clears throat> and everybody's got their name on one of these things that are very important for us to deliver. 
However, I would say as we go across the year, at the end of the day, we have to hit our numbers. So the conversion and new business, the things that we need to do to deliver our numbers are going to be ultimately important. If by Q2, we don't quite have it nailed down, then a couple of these things will get pushed. So we do have a very clear vision of the year, but that huge opportunity is so significant. You guys will be saying huge later. I know you will. <laughs> it's all about trying to deliver that 13 million, which is extremely important. And that's why that is at the top of our agenda. Okay? What's the number, Michaeli? <laughs> okay, so underneath that, there is between now and 2017 very clear goals and objectives, which include some very interesting things, moving into a new warehouse, moving beyond wine and spirits, craft beer, and some other kinds of things, uh, ciders, and, and some other interesting products. Um, but this is, again, something that fits underneath so that we all know where we believe we want to go, but we have an initiative, there's a clear measurement to success. And all of this will be shared in detail with everybody a little bit later. But right now, our key focus is 1,900 outlets. That's 38% of our total outlets. We have to find a way to sell spirits or wine wherever <coughs> we're not doing it. We also need only 290 net new outlets over the course of the next year. So this is a very achievable number, but it's going to be a big priority. So in order to do that, there are a couple of things that now the two businesses are together, we need to take a look at maybe some changes that will help us enhance this. One of the things that we've been talking about, Charlie in particular, is the need to not have a cookie cutter when it comes to channels. If we're talking to an independent specialist, the same as fine dining, the same as casual dining, it's a problem. You need a different portfolio, a different service level, different cost proposition, different person with skill sets going in and talking. But we haven't done that effectively as a business. Here's our opportunity to do that. We've got a very clear channel strategy um, to be able to develop something for each and every one of these um, segments that is a bit differentiated because that's going to be our expertise. These regional businesses we are going to go after these and be experts in this area and then bring that because this is where you build brands anyways. This is where people want to get to. This is where all the complexity of our warehouse will give us a competitive advantage. Another area is account segmentation. So we have segmented our accounts into A's, B's, and C's. And that's basically size and profitability. Now why did we do that? I've got 736 A's, some B's and C's. Well, this line is the gross margin. And if you look at C's, I'm making about 1,446 pounds of gross margin per year. And if you were to actually look at that, that's probably someone that wants some menus done. It's someone that calls every day to the customer service. They want some small drops, a bottle here, a bottle there. It's a pretty expensive proposition. B's, much better, four times as good. But your A's are sitting up there at 17,000 pounds per account. What we haven't done before is to differentiate between these accounts. And what we want to do is to allocate our resources effectively to A. So we may tell C's, you have to come in B to B. You can't call. I want you to only come in B to B, or you can only call Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, not when I'm busy because those are the accounts we don't want to lapse, and those are the accounts that we want to get. Does that make sense? We don't want to give someone bad service, but we really want to understand the profits of our customers and either enhance them <coughs> through actions taken internally so that we can make sure that most of our resources goes to our most profitable customers. And when we talked a lot about territory maps and some of these things that we're going to bring up, and we talked to this about the sales uh, teams, it's a change. Anatria historically has been very organic. And in some instances, I think I used uh, Guilford as an example, where uh, we have someone living in Guilford, 18A accounts, but that person living in Guilford only has 10 of those accounts. 
And so the cost and the time of people driving around to see your accounts, we want to minimize that to maximize the amount of time that you have in front of your customers. But historically what we've done is we haven't incented, we haven't been able to give the people the opportunity to do that. So what we want to do is work over the course of the year some different changes in the way that we as a business operate that are going to be more effective in managing our accounts. But at the same time, we don't want to be cookie cutter. We don't want to be Matthew Clark. We don't want to be Vivendum. So the sales teams are going to find that right balance, balance between what we want to be, this premium empathy, and good, efficient sales and marketing practices. Supply chain, here you are, Martin. For those of you that haven't seen the warehouse, there has been some spectacular, and the warehouse guys have done a tremendous job over the course of the past year in dealing with the substantial change and getting ourselves ready to go for Spirit's launch. But don't tell the warehouse guys I said that, they get cocky. So one of the things Martin has done is he's racked out the rest of the, the area in half pallet racks to allow us to get lots of complexity. So we have the ability to have 6,000 different SKUs in that warehouse, 800,000 cases. So that's pretty positive. It puts us right at the tip around Christmas. If we don't do anything, we're theoretically right at capacity, and this was 2015. So Martin, with some racking, has gotten us up to a higher level but we'll need to do a few things, and obviously at some stage, this means that we would want to move up north and get a warehouse up there. But the, the folks out in the supply chain have done a lot to get us specifically custom built for the spirits business that is coming in and the complexity around the, the bottle pick. This is the heat map, and you can see a whole bunch right around London. But what we want to do is to get the share, you can't see it very well up there. Um, because that's where the north is. So again, if we have something up there, big opportunity, it's north is up there. <laughs> but you can see that we're sort of staying close to home, and if there's an opportunity to get uh, something uh, in the Manchester Leeds area, I think the opportunity to get a lot of business up there um, also would be an opportunity. So this is the SNOP cycle. Tim already stood up. It's going to change the way that we operate. We're asking salespeople to tell us what you're selling, to validate some sales forecasts. It's going to feel uncomfortable because it's bureaucratic. But by doing this, we'll make sure that the inventory is on hand, available, and that the millions of pounds that we actually have invested in inventory gets reallocated in things like marketing and sales folks. So let's talk about FY16. Joe Adams was worried I didn't have enough numbers in my presentation, so I put these numbers in. So I first want to show this is a complete um, set of numbers that takes Co and Anatria together as if we had Co for the entire fiscal 14 and 15. And you'll see that the combined businesses get 8 million pounds of earnings in fiscal 14 and then drop down to seven and a half million pounds. But part of that is I've got a million pounds of incremental warehouse costs and the investment to put the systems in to be able to deliver that. Which means when I move everything together next year, I've got 13 million pounds. There is no one else, Matthew Clark is uh, sitting there at, at about 20, but on almost three times our volume. So the margin profile of being able to do this is quite stunning in this industry. So um, that number is something that is very achievable, but I mean, it really puts us in a, a different stratosphere when it comes to performance against our peer groups. So if you were to look now what it's going to look like to the external world, because we as a Natria were 4.4 and 14, the combination for a part-time of the year was 5.5, five, and then we're going up to 13. So essentially almost tripling our profitability in the course of two years. And I would just point out again, this kind of, so moving from 2 to 3% margin up to 6%, Matthew Clark is 1, 1 and a half. So again, a very solid, interesting business built at a premium level. Um, so this is a really solid set of uh, financial performance, but it means we have to deliver. 
I know I'm losing all the sales guys, I'm talking numbers. <laughs> what I want to point out is we have 11 million done. Our co-business, the Inatria business, and just the synergies of bringing people together, the reduced head count, and the supply chain gives us 11 million already. All we need to do is deliver an extra couple million pounds to get up to 13 this year. So that shouldn't be all that hard. It's a big number, sounds like a big number compared to where we are, but we're already baseline 11, and that's one of the key points. So if you look at how are we going to get from that 7.5 that we saw up to the 13, well, you've got some of these conversions, which are very important. So the on-trade basically gives us 2.7, and then the warehouse SG&As already happened. And then basically everybody else we're sort of saying is flat. Now, again, the off trades had a difficult time in the marketplace. We're not pushing giant tasks to anyone else. It's really focused on converting and delivering against the co-integration. That's what's going to get us to 13. If we find some other opportunities here, great. So for those of you that still aren't convinced it's a very achievable number, co between 2013 and 15 grew their margin at an average of 15%. We're forecasting the business to grow 2%. Our national accounts, Dan historically has done 14, we're asking for seven, and our regional business has historically for five years grown at an average at 7%, we're asking for 6%. So the growth rate that we're projecting, even with the conversions next year, are less than our historical average. Now it's higher than we were in 15, but it's no different than we have done for the last five years. So I believe this is a very achievable plan. And if you were talking to Blue Gem, it's a slam dunk. So one of the key areas I do want to bring on, it's not an achievable plan if we're not working together. But Bendham, Matthew Clark, Liberty, Venus, everybody's going to be coming after us next year. And if we're fighting with each other instead of fighting with them, we're going to have a problem. So we need to work together as one team. So although everybody's already figured it out, we worked very hard to try to figure out what our name was. We went with Enoco, Conatria, we did about everything we could. And we came up with the very interesting and innovative Anatria and Co. But I did tell John I'd keep John and Co in the name. But I do think the way that it's been presented, and I'll show you here uh, in a second, and many people have seen this, it does present uh, a little bit of the history of the business, but with a, a level of sophistication and cutting edge and, and newness that I think is actually pretty interesting in the way it can be executed. So the first thing to note, we actually do have a vision statement now. So we have had a number of teams working together to come up with a very clear vision statement. There will be separate meetings to go clearly through each of the vision, values, and culture. But right now, uh, mission, vision, values. Um, our vision, our passion is to inspire and create value for our partners through our crafted drinks portfolio, our unique insight, and truly outstanding service. You don't see price. You don't see just wine. So this is crafted drinks, premium positioning, service orientation um, for our business, and then us as experts of our category in both wine and spirits. I won't go through all of the missions at this stage, but there are a couple of key areas. Customers, obviously very important. Partnership with suppliers, so an area that we want to operate. We want to be the partner of choice for suppliers. And again, this is a bit of a difference. Matthew Clark's so big, they're the Tesco beyond trade, 40 share from a supply standpoint. And they'll go to Brown Foreman, and they'll go to Jim Beam, and they'll say, who's going to pay me more? And then whoever pays them more, then they say, okay, I'm going to put your product on the shelf. And so they give everybody 50-pound vouchers if they can convert a beam to a Jack Daniels or a Jack Daniels to a beam. Well, that's not a very interesting sales approach. It doesn't build the category whatsoever. Now, what we want to do is not that. We want to go build our category at our restaurants. We want to find a way to bring premium spirits to our customers in a way that values them, values their consumers, and our suppliers will enjoy uh, obviously seeing the kind of premium positioning that we can, just as we've done with all of our wine business on the Anatria side. So um, 
people, obviously a key aspect to it, and then the service proposition, which you'll see is a point of difference for us. So from a core values, and the one point this is going to be brought out a couple of times over the next quarter, I would say, in various meetings through your uh, uh, function, but it's really important that we do live by our values. We sort of said as a notch here that we've had values before, then you see people not exhibiting those values and getting away with it. I would suggest that over the course of the next year, you will see people that do not follow the kind of behavior that we want to see that's going to make us successful will be dealt with um, as opposed to maybe in the past they were allowed to get away with that kind of behavior. We have to work together. This is what it's going to take for us to be successful, and I would expect all of us to be there. So here are, and probably can't see it clearly, Val, I'm sorry, but um, I think the, the way that this has been presented for those of you that have seen our, our books and the, the style, the newness, um, the color palette, I think it looks very sophisticated, um, sort of bringing a bit of the respect from the past, but it's not comical, it's very premium, and so I think the position is actually really good. So externally, the values that we want people, our customers, to think of us are as leaders. We add value. We're sort of, again, this John Lewis, not John Smith, of the market. And so this is the kind of position that we're trying to pick up. And this is what people should be seeing of us. So this is all going to get tidied up and delivered to you in a little bit more formal process in a smaller group. But I think it actually does bring the essence of the two companies together, understanding where the market is going, and it position, positions us with, yes, this history and heritage, but not stuffy, and someone that can lead from the front and at a premium position. So I think it's actually, despite the, the name may, maybe not being the most creative thing in the world, I think the positioning is done really well. You can see, I'm not sure how it's going to look in our vans at this stage, but something like that. Okay, so all that highfalutin strategy, you'll spend more time going through it, but at the end of the day, it's going to be the account conversions as a priority. So one of the reasons that we've gotten everybody together here is that we've spent a week getting all the sales folks really tied together and ensuring that we can go deliver against a huge financial opportunity for the business. And strategic, because this is going to have a real knock-on impact. And so everybody in the organization should be really focused on this. I know a whole week of having salespeople off the road and working together um, is always a bit of a challenge, but I think it's been um, really uh, handled very well. I, I compliment everybody from the sales standpoint that have participated. It's great to see both Anatri and Co. come together and suddenly we are one company. And in order to sort of do a bit of a recap of the last few days, I think we've got a bit of a video that'll sort of show you what's been going on. <laughs>
Take it, take a bow. That was all you yeah. yeah. And so, um, I think it's been a great week, mm -hmm. even though I haven't been here the whole time. Um, I hear that. There are a couple of people that have worked extremely hard to pull this together, so if I could call them out specifically for thanks. Mike Bevan back there, well done, mate. Good job. Chris May somewhere around here. Uh, it inevitably falls down to Rebecca, Joe, and Alice to sort all the crap out. So well done to all you guys. Uh, and there's a bunch of other people, so well done. Um, so let's come back to the key messages. Uh, now you're excited. Oh, he's almost done. Ooh, yeah. It has been a busy last couple of years, we have stubbed our toe in a couple of places, but I look around this room and just going through that video and I mean, you feel good on what's happened and how far we've come. So I think we're incredibly well positioned and it's been difficult to get here, but I thank everybody for their hard work that have done this and all the emotions and challenges, even from the coast side, you know, where your entire world has been thrown upside down. I tell you the co over the last week, two weeks, three weeks, the way you guys have sort of supported and jumped on board and sort of engaged and embraced the opportunity to bring the whole organization up has been outstanding. So that's what makes me really excited. Um, we have grown, but we brought on a lot of great people and the co-folks, what I just talked about, and a number of the other folks in the organization. So again, really putting ourselves in a very good position. And guess what? The market's going to get harder. But nobody else has those top two things to the level that we just have been, put, been able to put together. So there's nobody out there that should be able to beat us. Because we do have a, a very clear strategy, awesome strategy. I have spent hours with you going through it if you want. But we got to execute. So this all makes sense until you get out there and you're not clear what to do and we have a couple of problems. So. <laughs> the most average strategy, violently executed, beats the best strategy in the world. And that's why we have got to go out there Monday and start converting some accounts. Because FY16 is the defining year. There are people, I think, over the course of the next year that are not going to be around at the end of the year. And there's going to be some people at the top. And we are going to be the people at the top. So what can you do? I'm not doing this all myself. I want you, in one month, to ask yourself, do I understand this incredibly brilliant strategy Troy articulated? Do I understand it? And do I understand how I fit and how I contribute to that strategy? And do I understand if I know what I'm doing is working or if the strategy is working? If in one month you can't answer those questions, then you better tap your boss on the shoulder, or come see me, and we'll make sure that that's clear. Because we need to go into this year with clarity on how this all works. I need everybody to proactively work with each other. We haven't thought of everything. There are gonna be so many hurdles thrown at us over the course of the next year. And if you let something sit there, assuming someone else is gonna pick it up, it probably isn't going to happen. I am asking everybody here to proactively work when you see a challenge or an opportunity to go find its solution. Okay? And then we got to live the values. So a lot of times people put these mission, visions, and values up there, and you throw it on the wall. I'm sure we'll even put it on the wall somewhere, and you guys say, oh, that's nice. It's great to look at it one day, and then suddenly you ignore it. But they're there for a reason because this is how we want to work together to be effective. These are the kinds of people we want to recruit in the organization. And if people don't fit, then we're not going to be successful. <coughs> so this is what I'm asking everybody to do. And if not, leave the office. <laughs> <laughs> think we can do that? Yeah. yeah. OK. And I am serious about I think this can be the most exciting 
uh, premium wine and spirits distributor in the world because we get to see a breadth the accounts. I mean, it, it is such a great business to be in, and I feel lucky to be here, and I'm thrilled that everybody's here as well, and what we have ahead of us is going to be a great journey over the course of the next year, and I thank you in advance for all the work and all the success. Thank you.